So yeah. So we will wait another minute that we can get started. Now the the number of attendees is increasing. So again, we can wait another minute. I'm assuming you see just the big screen right now. Yes. Perfect. Uh, welcome to the August Cannabis Cultivation Webinar. We are about to commence shortly, but beforehand, we would like to provide a moment for attendees to join the webinar. Okay, it appears that the number of attendees has increased and stabilized, so we can now proceed. Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm Seng Park, a senior scientist at the Institute of Cannabis Research, and I have the honor of chairing this webinar series. The Institute of Cannabis Research, in collaboration with the Volcani Institute in Israel, is delighted to welcome you to our August webinar. Before diving into our presentation, I would like to express my heartfelt appreciation to all those who supported the Cannabis Research Conference held during the first week of August in Denver. With around 350 attendees, the conference was a resounding success. We are eagerly awaiting your feedback. So please don't hesitate to share any suggestions with our ICR team. Your input will greatly influence the planning of next year's conference. Once again, thank you for your unwavering support. Furthermore, I'd like to provide some logistical details for the webinar. Following today's presentation, there will be a brief period for questions and answers. To pose a question, kindly utilize the Q&A feature available in the Zoom toolbar. Feel free to submit your questions at any point during the presentation, and we will address as many as time permits, concluding by the end of the hour. Please refrain from using the chat function for questions during this period. Reserve it instead for technical inquiries and concerns. Both the Q&A and chat functions can be assessed via the toolbar on, on your Zoom screen. Um, the, Dr. Nuri Bernstein, our co-chair of Webinar is supposed to be here to moderate the uh, mark the presentation, but I was informed that she's having some technical issues. I think she's joining a little bit later. So I will give a brief introductions of Dr. Mark Lapsrod. And okay, I think Nirit is here. <laughs> hey Nirit, um, I'm about to give give him a uh, like the introduction to. So can you just introduce? The mark. I think you have an audio problem. I can't hear you. Yeah, let's give her a few seconds, maybe. No, we don't hear you yet. Um, why don't why don't I kind of introduce Mark instead while she's working on her, on her audio? Uh, Dr. Lapsrud is an associate professor at McGill University and lead the biomass production laboratory. His education is uh, bachelor's in science and MS in the Rutgers University in agricultural and Bioresources Engineering and a PhD in the University of Tennessee in plant physiology, giving him a background in agriculture, biology, and engineering. The laboratory's primary goal is the improvements of plants for human consumption, 
food security, post-harvest processing, and energy. Within the focus of food security, uh, they are investigating method for controlled environments, agriculture, and indoor plant environments, including research for medicinal cannabis, northern greenhouse, tropical greenhouses, greenhouse heating using wood pellets. Okay. And, uh, yeah, light emitting diodes and um, heating uh, HVAC and technology for improving vertical farming. I think I take too much time for the introduction. So Mark, it is all yours. Mark? Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to start off here. Uh, a lot of this work is actually being done by my students, and I'll try to highlight them as they come along through these parts and other groups that I'm actually working with. So I'll try to highlight all of them. So my name is Mark Lefstrad. Uh, I'm an associate professor and William Dawson scholar at McGill University. Uh, and I've been here for about 16 years now in the bioresource engineering department. Uh, and you can see some of the pretty little pictures that we put together on the title slide for this. Let's make sure I go to the second slide here. Come on. There we go. Slide number two. There we go. Um, so yeah, so my background, um, I have a PhD in plant physiology out of the University of Tennessee and agricultural engineering or bioresource engineering out of the University of Saskatchewan and the University of Alberta. I come from, originally was born and raised in Alberta, so in Western Canada. Um, and then I have a bit of an interesting background where I worked in the oil industry for a year. I worked for the Department of Energy for a year as a postdoc. And I also worked for Orbitech, which is now the Sierra Nevada Corporation designing spaceflight hardware for them. So if anybody's ever interested, that's a, all interesting side talks. Uh, I've, the lab's been running for about 16 years now. We've kicked out a fair number of students. I think we're almost 100 students that we've graduated, both masters, PhDs, and postdocs have come through the lab out of this. And I just wanted to highlight that it, we work on a lot of controlled environment space, um, both greenhouses, northern food security, uh, indoor agricultural space, vertical farming, LED lighting technology. And then also one of the fun little ones is the grasses growing there is actually on a porous concrete, but we'll not one we're going to be talking about today. Uh, a couple of years ago, Canada legalized cannabis. It was actually quite a few years ago now. Um, and there was kind of a, a from our perspective, a, a lack of knowledge within the industry, uh, at least from a scientific perspective. Most of the discussion and thought processes on how to grow cannabis have occurred through either word of mouth or through bulletin boards. And usually, I'd say in most cases, it's actually not uh assigned as, through scientific processes. And so the, the amount of information that has been published has been quite lacking. And I know Nareet was one of the first to actually start pushing on that from a nutrient standpoint. And there was also the groups out of Guelph and other uh, Spain and other places around the world that have been trying to fill these voids. One of the things that we did at McGill was we actually set up two different groups. The first one was the, the MRCC, so the McGill Research Center for Cannabis. Um, and it's a joint collaboration between the Faculty of Agriculture, uh, the Faculty of Medicine downtown, as well as the legal um, or the law faculty. And so we're trying to work together and see where there was holes and gaps on this. And we kind of have a, a group that's been working together for just over, I'd say, over six years now. Uh, as there's a component, at least the, the McGill uh, McDonald campus side is predominantly focused on plant research and the environment. And so we actually, as a group, kind of put together a proposal where we were going to try to improve the, the quality standard of the cannabis through the production of it, as well as the processing of that. So we ended up proposing through a, a grant known as the CREATE grant through NSERC, uh, something that we call the QAQCC or the Quality Assurance and Quality Control for Cannabis Protection. And so we're in the process of training around 60 students, both masters and PhDs, predominantly master's students on this, um, to actually gain knowledge base, everything from the cultivation side, plant breeding, all the way through to extraction and food, food uh, formulations. We are actually doing slight work with some of the medical school also. For, so some of our extracts are actually being used for uh, at least cell line testing and such like that. Uh, the goal of that group has been to try to one, produce a group that's pan-Canadian. So and I won't say we're overly good at that, but we have a start. So we have the University of Saskatchewan's involved with this, the University of Ottawa, and, the, and McGill is the one that's leading these. 
And so we're working with these different groups to try to, and universities to try to train these students so that they can go out into industry. Up to this point, we've had 32 students that are being trained. Our goal is to try to hit 60 in the next couple of years. And then as part of the initiative of this, we train them up on QAQCC standards or QAQC standards, and then also have linkages with both government and industry. So we work quite strongly with Health Canada on this to try to develop methods to, to push these processes forward and try to have publications. As one of the parts of this, we have actually had a symposium. We're on our, we'll be going on to our third symposium in the spring, uh, which we call From Plants to People, the Cannabis Symposium. And the students present a lot of their research on this. And we also invite people from around the world to try to be parts of do talks on this. And the idea is that after the, this training, they can actually go out and uh, work in industry or in government as required, possibly going to academia also. We've been doing fairly well, at least within our group, publishing cannabis publications on this. Uh, and we see other groups that are also we're working with. So there's a lot of collaboration that are building on this, but we're, our goal has been to try to validate methods and standards that can be used as we start this develop, the, as this industry starts to develop further. We find that a lot of the legacy growers of black market underground systems that are on there have methods that they do and we don't understand why they're doing that. Uh, and to be brutally honest, I'm not sure they always completely understand either. And so the idea is that, well, let's figure out what is the scientific methodology to, to try to prove some of these things are right or wrong and try to clean up some of these things. And we'll talk about a few of those as I work my way through this. Since cannabis is legal within Canada um, at varying levels, depending on how you want to go between the pro provincial jurisdictions, um, we have to have some kind of a unifying system. So currently that falls to Health Canada. One of the things that we highlight here is that we are training these highly qualified personnel and they're going out into the industry and being hired by a lot of these groups. So we look at it from both a cannabis cultivation perspective, a post-harvest processing and uh, handling mechanisms, compound extraction and analysis and formulation. And then all of these things kind of tie into the, the end game, which is actually reaching the medical and non-medical fields. And so how are these things going to be uh, beneficial for this? We've been fairly successful, as I said, up to this point, and we're continuing on down this road. And I'll, at the very end, if anybody has questions on this specifically, Sarah McPherson is the is the coordinator for this whole group and keeps me aligned on this and the rest of us that are working on this. And so she's the one that can do that. So if you just type in QAQCC into any, any search algorithm, it should find us. All right, so I'm gonna jump ahead into my research component now. So as I said before, this is a lot of research that's been done by my students. Um, and so I have a fairly large lab that works on these different projects. This was one of the first ones that we did with an, a lighting. Um, I like working with LEDs. I've published a fair bit of it, both in the lettuce, tomato, um, now starting to build up in the cannabis area, but a lot of the different uh, horticultural type crops, at least from a consumption perspective. Um, and so the, the idea was what was going to happen if we used single wavelength or very narrow spectrum LEDs and see what would happen on the plant production perspective. And so we ended up linking with one of our industry partners on this, being able to do it at a site that would allow the number of plants. Um, even though cannabis is legal, it is still highly regulated and there is still limitations on what you can and cannot do based on what those, those regulations are. So simplest thing was we ended up having six different light treatments. Uh, and so we actually called them the red, blue, uh, rose, purple, uh, a standard HPS light and then an amber light. And if anybody's followed any of my research, I'm a big fan of amber light. And we pushed on that to try to increase our biomass or yield production of a lot of different parts. And so how would that have, impact the plant? So here's the different kinds of lights that you can see, high pressure sodium and the ones that I talked about there. So when we talk about rose, it has a high amount of red with a little bit of blue. And then purple has a obviously a high amount of blue with a little bit of red. So just the inverse of each other on that. And then the other ones are fairly narrow spectrum. So a 630 nanometer for the red um, and a 430 roughly for the blue on the spectrum. And then we had our standard, which is the high pressure sodium. We understand leaf, leaf temperature and we were able to monitor some of that uh, impacts and they're all done in the same space. So the, the, the local environment is fairly standard across the board for these. As you see, the plants look fairly similar across slightly different shades of green. Um, but they all produced fairly healthy looking plants and were fairly uniform across the boat. Uh, 
when we looked at it, one of the standard arguments on why we don't use amber is a lot of early research said that it caused a lot of elongation. Uh, we've been able to show through tomato and other plants that as we increase our amber percentage, that mm. elongation actually becomes less and less. And so our perspective is that we, we need to see how these changes actually will impact the plant and plant quality out of this. From this initial part of the study, you can see we do end up with a taller plant under amber, so a bit more elongation occurring on that. Internodal lengths become a bit taller. Fairly still comparable to the HPS. We see that it is statistically different, but they are comparable for it. Um, and then if you want to have a more dwarf plant, then you can use blue light to actually shrink these plants down quite a bit. We then took them all the way through flowering and actually took them to final harvest. So we were able to measure the buds of the inflorescence that were out of this. And we measured both on a fresh and dry weight perspective. You look at it from an amber perspective, which is where I started off with, you can see that that's a little bit lower. HPS is considered the industry standard. And within our work, we've actually find that it, it holds up quite well. Uh, some of the later studies after this, which we haven't published quite yet, shows that we can actually now surpass HPS. Um, and it's partially because you have to play with the, the spectrum and the wavelengths that you're do, do, dealing with on that. So under the fresh weight, HPS was the most consistently high one. The rose, which is the high red, low blue component out of it, has fairly was fairly comparable and statistically the same out of that. Pure red also was quite good. And then amber caused a bit of a drop off on the fresh weight uh, of the blood flower buds. As we start to add more and more blue into it, though, we actually start to cut down on the amount of inflorescence that are, are occurring on this and the size and the mass of those also drop down on this. Under the dry dry uh, mass perspective, it was very similar to that. So we didn't see a, a shift of uh, concentrating of any other compounds that could have caused that changes. We then measured the THC concentration of these um, flower buds. Uh, we did break them down into the top and bottom. We, and I'm not presenting them here, but if you want to go find the paper, it actually talks about that. But you can see that the THC content for the HBS is one of the highest that occurs on this, with blue actually being the winner out of the lot. And so you can get quite high concentrations of THC when you add more blue light to it to the mixture as opposed to the more broad spectrum white or the, the, the more narrow reds kind of perspective out of this. Uh, if you look at it from a CBD perspective, follow a somewhat similar trend also from that. If you measure it as a total plant, since I do a fair bit of extraction with them in my lab, we don't buy, people will buy just the individual flowers for smoking and for processing, but then other people will actually want to extract whatever chemicals are being produced by that plant. So it'd almost be a, a measure of per lamp. Um, I know some people that will grow one, one flat, I mean, one plant per flat, sorry, to go back, one plant per lamp. And so if you're in that case, fair enough, that's what we're working at, but you can also have multiple plants per per lamp from those. If you're looking at it per amount of per plant, HPS is consistently the best out of the lot. And then the blue actually drops itself down just because the overall yield is quite a bit less. You get a higher concentration, but you don't get as much yield out of it. So the HPS, and you'll see that in a little bit, the couple other studies we've done, which we actually call power utilization or energy utilization rate for this, for the generation of these compounds. Uh, amber is about comparable to the blue, and you can see that rose and the HPS are kind of the winners out of this with HPS being our consistent winner out of the lot. We also looked at the total terpene concentration out of this and HPS consistently also is one of the top producers for the total number of terpenes that are being generated with less being generated in the amber and the blue with the with a slight difference depending on if you're measuring it as total plant or as a as a sample or per bud equivalence is what it would work out to, at least in the case of the blue, where amber is more consistent across that. So takeaways out of this is that individual wavelengths can be used. And I think in the future, we should be using these for actually tailoring uh, what we want out of the plants. Uh, one of the arguments that you can easily have out of this one was, well, why did you stick with amber for, through the whole experiment? When technically there's not a good reason for that. We already do the change from a vegetative state to a flowering state. So you could actually grow the plant under vegetative state with a high amber, get your high biomass that you want out of it so that it's in a healthy state. And then you can start ramping up your blue light to try to increase your THC. Um, those are follow-up studies that we're gonna be working on. Uh, we haven't, we've actually started a few of those, but we haven't published any of these things, but that is things that you can do. So you can actually start to direct or control the plant production out of these perspectives. Um, we do see that the, we still use the McCree curve as our baseline for a lot of this. 
there is some cases where we're finding that it, it does have a bit of a weakness to it. I won't say it's wrong by any stretch, um, but it just wasn't fine enough resolution for what LEDs can do. So we have to be aware of that. And since I am still a big fan of amber light, then we can use that to actually start to compete with the HPS. There is rumors here in Canada that HPS is going to be banned at some point, and so we need to have mechanisms that can surpass this. Uh, a lot of people's argument up to this point is that it's the leaf temperature effect. We do see increases of that with the HPS, but I'm not sold that that is the primary reason for it. I think it's just a component of it. Um, and so there's other ways to play with those factors. Uh, the second study I'm going to talk about, this one was presented at the, at the Denver Converse just a little bit ago, so a couple of weeks ago, um, and Justin presented on that. I see Justin's on online on this one, so if anybody wants to reach out to him, hopefully I'm not going to say anything too crazy about what he's done. Uh, but basically, the idea was, can we evaluate the impact of doing overhead lighting, uh, compare HPS to LED, which I'd say has been done a fair number of times, but then we also added an interlighting system to it, so that Philips... Uh, provided us with this interlighting LED system within the canopy. And so we could actually shine these into it and see what's the impact of adding these extra light at that location specifically to the plant. And so you can see the layout of the with overhead lighting system over top of the plants and then the lighting um, below, which is the kind of the pinkish lines going in between. And so the plants were growing in between. I mean, the, the, the lights were put in after the plants were growing. And so it became a bit of a challenge to maintain uh, quality and to do the pruning and other parts, but we were able to make it through two complete cycles. Justin did a really good job. It's actually eerie how close he was able to maintain the environment between the two cycles out of this one. Um, and then we're able to collect the data out of it. So it starts off with a large number of plants. We're able to uh, bring them through the vegetative stage to the flowering stage. And then we're able to take the, the fresh and dry masses of these plants and partition both the, the leaves as stems as well as our uh, inflorescence that are being generated. Uh, we were able to take different samples. So we were able to monitor both above and below a certain level. So we have upper canopy and a lower canopy measurement. And so we can actually see, and there's was a fair bit of research that has been done up to this point that says that there's differences based on how much light you're given for at least a THC concentration of this. And so does this data actually support that perspective? So total amount of light, obviously, uh, HPS, uh, it, it, well, it doesn't have to be, but in our case, it was a little bit less light um, from this. The LEDs were a higher light level out of this. And then the intercanopy lighting. So the, the HT stands for HPS treatment. LT is LED treatment. And then the I at the end is the inter, interlighting system, always LEDs based on that. And so you can see that the LED treatment with interlighting actually has the total, highest amount of total light. Um, and then we can segregate out what we think the portion of the light is impacting this. And you'll see it as we walk our way through this. One of the things that did happen was the interlighting actually kept the plant a little bit shorter as a whole. Uh, and then we also allowed more growth that occurred down a little bit lower, which was partially a management technique, um, just because it was challenging with the lights down there. But we did see that slight shortening also occurring within that state. Uh, total mass, fluorescence mass, was actually fairly comparable if you look at it from a total perspective. So those are the dark bars uh, across the, the top there. So they were almost identical. So the interlighting just bumped up everything up that little bit down at the bottom. And so we went up that 25 to 29 um, grams per plant, went up by having those extra. And so we were able to correlate those that extra little bit of light. We think it's more than just the extra bit of light. It's actually the more uniform light and spread out over it. So you can actually get a total higher yield total, more so than if you would have just said it was just the extra light that's being generated out of this. And you'll see that in a second also. Uh, we also monitored the difference between the, the large flowers versus the small flowers. And they stayed fairly comparable across it. Uh, obviously, adding in a little bit of uh, inter lighting below would have expected and that's what we ended up getting was a little bit more of the small flowers actually started to come in on this one but it and that's what kind of bumped everything up that little bit um so there was a, a bit of a change in the ratios i won't say huge um, but it does cause some of these slight shifts that but the percentages as a whole stayed about the same thing so it wasn't a large differential on that one of the things that justin did quite well 
why I'm actually kind of why I'm presenting the data here is he actually went down and broke it out into how much light energy use efficiency was or power use efficiency. So the total number of micromoles of light that were actually provided or moles of light that were provided to the plant. And then also the amount of energy that was consumed by the lamps to actually generate this. And so when you look at this, the light use efficiency, which is the darker of the two, not the hash marks, uh, you can see that the HPS is actually quite, quite good over the LED. Um, but as you add in the interlighting, then they could become closer to comparable on this. So the, the HPS light, the take home from this is that HPS light is a very good light. Uh, it's been the industry standard for a reason. I don't think people completely understand why it's been that way. That's back to the whole argument with McCree, and we can discuss that more if anybody actually wants to call me out on it. But basically, we we see that there's a higher amount of amber light that's present in that with a mixture of the reds and the, than the blues that are along on this. And so we actually find that it is quite an energy efficient lighting system, probably one of the best um, with some of the stuff that we're now able to push out that says that we can actually push past that a little bit, but it's based on still the same principles of what the HPS is. We're looking at it purely from an LED, um, not quite as good at light emitting, well, actually quite efficient at producing photons of light, but not always the photons that the plant wants to utilize out of this one. So it's a slightly less, I wouldn't say hugely less. Um, and then as we bring in the intercanopy lighting system for it, it bumps everything up just that little bit from that perspective. If we look at it from a power use efficiency, uh, the power usage is almost identical across all the primary ones at the bottom. So HPS uh, for both types, as well as the LED overhead. But when we add in the interlighting, that's where we see a bump up in the total efficiency of it. So we're providing a, a better light source or a more uniform light source throughout the whole canopy. And from that perspective, the plant is able to utilize that light a little bit more efficiently and able to generate more biomass out of that. So the take home of this is that HPS is really good, but if you wanna have good uniform crops that are consistent and one of the more effect, energy efficient, having some kind of sublighting or interlighting system actually uh, is able to bump you up that extra little bit. And you have to do the economics, we did not do that, but it looks from our perspective, it should be economical to do that. It just means you have to modify how you do your pruning and your management systems out of this. Uh, we also saw under the THC, perspective, we saw a bump up with the interlighting systems and the LEDs themselves also had a slight increase in how much THC was being generated within the plant. Uh, and if you look at it both from the, the first set of the graphs here is actually on the upper canopy. So that would be the direct light, not much of the interlighting would be reaching that. And then the middle and lower, which would be predominantly the, the interlighting system for that, we see a bump up in almost all of those. So it, was, it has a benefit for that. And if we actually do it as a total THC per plant or to total THC plant use, I'm sorry, uh, power use efficiency for the THC per, per the amount of energy being provided, then we can actually see that it, it increases. So we go from an HPS, which is quite good. Um, but then as we do the LEDs, we get more THC. As we saw earlier, we saw a higher concentration of those ones. And then as we add the interlighting, it bumps everything up that little bit more. And so the take home of this, if, if you're after big, large plants, HPS work really, really well. If you want HPS, uh, if you want plants with higher THC, adding some interlighting of LEDs actually pushes those up a little bit higher. Um, and if you're more energy constrained and want to use the LEDs through both of them, they seem to be our consistent winner. And since we're getting paid by, in most cases, based on your THC content of your buds, which is a dry mass or semi-dry mass perspective, then it makes sense for us to go down that road. Um, and this is just a repeat of the last part, which is just showing that the, the canopy is slightly shifting on this. As we add in the interlighting systems, we can actually bump up the numbers a little bit on those. Uh, CBD follows a similar trend to, uh, CBG follows a similar trend on this. And so you can actually see that the LEDs are able to push these things up. From a terpene perspective, there was no difference seen on any of these ones. And um, Justin's only showing a few here, but you can see that there's a lot that is actually involved with this. And so basically we didn't see it on any of them. So basically top lighting increased our dry inflorescence per plant, which was good. Concentration of THC also went up on this and the power use efficiency went up. So basically the take home is that if you have money and you wanna invest in lighting systems, having both interlighting and overhead lighting is beneficial out of this. And the uniformity of the, the cannabis also was quite good 
as you add lighting in between, it seems to improve the quality overall for that. Will not say that I did, or anybody that I know did any testing on them beyond the actual analytical perspective. So that is something that somebody will have to tell us after they've done it. Uh, let's see, next part of it. So this is a, so that was the, the first two talks was on the, the LED lighting work that we've been doing. Now I'm gonna be talking about post-harvest processing. Uh, one of the major students involved with this was uh, Philip Werdu Adu, who has actually completed his PhD and is working as a postdoc in the lab. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other students that are also involved with it, but I'm not highlighting any of them at this point, but they are listed at the very end as a thank you. Um, but basically trying to figure out what is the impact of us doing certain kinds of different processing on these. So we've looked at it from a drying perspective. We've looked at it from grinding and extraction methodologies and trying to set up models and things to try to optimize these. One of our industry partners is quite big into extraction. And so how do we maximize their yield so that they can be as economical as possible? make as much money as possible out of it based on the samples that they had. We don't want things to be lost and have to go down the drain or be disposed of when we could still extract these. So here's the title slide for Philip's work. Uh, we know that the industry standard up to this point is doing hang drying. It takes quite a while, depends on what your humidity level is and how well you can control that. So, but it can be, I don't know if I can do it faster than two weeks, but let's say two weeks to a couple months is what the standard practice is across the board. You have to have a fairly good HVAC and you have to be able to control your humidity within those spaces. They take up a large, large amount of space. Previous on other research, not on cannabis directly, we've done a lot of work on using freeze drying techniques. And we find that it's actually superior in a lot of ways. So we started to say, well, what happens if we start to do it on cannabis for this? We also compared it to some other systems that we have within the lab, which is a microwave assisted hot air drying and then a standard hot air drying system. And would be methods that we could actually use to determine whether or not the plant is dry and maintain quality. And you'll see how that plays out on one of the last talks on it. So we're looking at it from a different perspective. We understand that if you force too much hot air on a plant, you can actually over dry it and it becomes brittle and looks kind of ugly, which is what that one image is on there. But then we also know that we have to be able to maintain a certain quality so that we can't get any um, fungal activity on these or bacteria growth on them that can actually cause a bit of a challenges down the road, um, which could actually cause harm. And so our idea is, well, is there ways that we can process these so that we can shorten their, their drying cycle we can, uh, or we can process them in such a way that we can actually try to maximize some of our yield responses, especially from the extraction perspective. And so we have the benefit in our, in our greater lab area that we have a scanning electron microscope. So we're able to look at what the trichomes look like under the scanning electron microscope and then look at them after, before and after we go through these drying processes and figure out what is the optimum. One of the things that we ended up doing was we did a lot of freezing of our samples. Um, I know most people don't like to do this. They'd rather do hang drying on them, but we were finding that from an extraction perspective, we wanted to see what happens. So if we're trying to extract the chemicals, having pre-frozen samples, which actually slightly damages the trichome, allows them to dry that much quicker. And to be perfectly honest, actually allows us to extract the samples a little bit more cleaner um, out of these parts. And then we watch the, the cooling rates as they go down through the different strains that we played with. Um, and if we look at it from this, we can actually get drying times that can be dr drastically reduced. So as I said before, let's say two weeks is the absolute fastest you could ever do an air drying, hang drying type system. Uh, we get ours down into the hours, six, eight hours. We've been a little bit faster than that. If we do freeze drying, if we do forced air drying, obviously it takes a little bit longer than that but we can bring them down into very, very short cycles out of this. And the benefit of this is that we can push through more product through this. The other advantage is that the way a freeze dryer works is you're actually at low atmosphere pressure. And so a lot of the lower or more easily volatile compounds like the terpenes actually aren't being pushed off at quite the same rate. And so one of our arguments is that if we go through a dry, proper drying step, i.e. freeze drying, we don't have to go through the curing step, which is a rebalancing of the moisture and the other components that are present in this. And so we're able to, to work our way through that. One of the interesting things we found when we were doing the freeze drying is that it happened so fast that if you aren't paying attention, you can actually overshoot it and make it way too dry for you. So we actually started doing monitoring where we'd actually use sensors, um, moisture sensors and humidity sensors specifically. And if we place them in within 
if we place them within the plant sample within the freeze dryer system, we can actually monitor almost to the second where it was going to hit whatever percentage set point we wanted to hit. So let's say you're aiming for 12% moisture content, we can hit at that. We were taking samples, obviously, and oven drying them down to, to zero so that we would be confirmed. But once we had that calibration curve on it, it was fairly easy. Once you hit this point, you confirmate the, the drying and you're good to go. And I don't see that within most of the industry, at least at this point. We're going to have to be able to track these things at some level so that we can follow the sample through and say that we're confirmed that we're sitting at a certain point. I know a lot of people like using uh, activated or water activity uh, as a means for monitoring these ones. I am not a huge fan of that, to be perfectly honest. I'd rather know my fresh weight, dry weight um, perspective or fresh mass, dry mass perspective, and then be able to say what that percentage of moisture that's in the sample. It is more of a food science perspective. The ag engineering me doesn't typically use that for almost anything. So we're aware it exists and there probably will have to be a bit of a compromise between the groups um, as we start to build these systems and monitor which way it works on this. But it's kind of a rough ballpark of what your moisture content is, is what water activity. It works most of the time, but there's many papers out there that says that it fails miserably under certain circumstances. So there has to be understanding of what's happening across these parts. Uh, here's a little sensor that we can place it within our plant humidity sensor, which we can actually track the moisture content and watch it collapse um, as it dries itself out quite quickly out of this. And so this is some custom work that uh, Philip had done so that we can pull these uh, pull real time data off of during the drying sample. Uh, and then we also one of the things that we found kind of interesting is we can actually shorten that drying time, as I said before, quite a bit. And depending on how we optimize our temperature of the, the shelves that we're working with. So what the actual temperature of the sample is under the, the, the lower atmospheric pressure, we can actually shift that drying time even more. Uh, one of the things that we found interesting is we can actually cause some conversion of the of the THC and the CB. Uh, DA could actually be shifted in some of these. We don't think that it's a true conversion process, but we think there's other things that are going on within the plant sample. And if you want to talk to Philip about that, he's more than willing to talk about how those shifts occur and what we think we can use to control these. So specifically for extraction, there's no good, there, there's a, a reasonable argument that I can say that I can take my sample and do a process on it. Um, and, but then if I want to convert it into the active compound, then I have to do a secondary compound. We could actually do it all as one process. So that's the benefit of it is it has a shorter cycle time and less handling steps required as part of this. Um, so basically, as I said, pre-freezing is important. Um, we can maintain a lot of these different compounds, terpenes, as well as the other compounds present. We can actually shorten that processing drying time, and we can actually have mechanisms to monitor these things is the take home of Phillips. Let's see, I'm at 38 minutes roughly here. Okay, so I'll be fine with my next set of talks. So one of my students uh, who's actually almost ready to graduate, he thinks he wants to do a postdoc, but if anybody's interested in offering him a lot of money, I'm sure he's willing to work in industry also out of this. Um, but he's been working with Health Canada. So one of the benefits of being having part of the QAQCC in Canada is that we actually have the ability to do internships with our students at different locations. And it's actually a requirement as part of the program. So they have to work with our industry partners. Um, but we also have the ability to send them to governmental labs and learn and work with them at those locations. So Health Canada has been very open for us for this. We've had a number of students that have gone through the program that have been stationed there for their four month internship. And in some cases they do quite contributing work that actually can change um, allows for publications, but also can change standards and build on our knowledge base around the world. So this is one of them, which is Vincent's, basically looking at what fungal contamination um, can do to the product and is there ways that we can monitor these. Uh, basically, we know that mitotoxins uh, can, can be generated through these fungi that can live on these products and if not properly dried will actually can cause some harm. I know a lot of the more legacy people say that as long as I smoke it, it shouldn't matter. I'm not guaranteeing that's a, the best approach on this. And as research is coming out, we're seeing that maybe it isn't. So we just have to stop it from being present. The radiation kills off the organisms, but doesn't actually destroy the mitotoxins on them. And so we actually have to have methodologies to monitor these things so that they aren't building up within the people who are actually consuming these, specifically for medical applications. So if you're using it as a cancer patient, you don't want to be adding another chemical that could be causing harm to these individuals. So we, one of the consequences we believe of this research is that we're going to have to start monitoring for all of these compounds. 
So basically they can cause illness. In humans, we know that they can be during the growing and the storage conditions, and they come from a couple different places. And so if they're in the food source, they can actually be quite harmful. And so our argument is that if it's also in the cannabis, it can also be quite harmful. And so we have to be aware of these ones. So here's the, the different toxins that we've been talking about here. So the aflatoxins, and there's four different kinds of that. Um, I always mangle the names of the other ones, so I apologize, but oractin toxin, and I'll just call it Dawn. So those six are the major ones that we're interested in. As you can see, the concentration are actually very low, some as low as five parts per billion, so very, very low concentration of these things. And so part of Vincent's work was, how do I actually um, take these samples, um, extract them and be able to monitor down to that five parts per billion process? Um, and can we quantify them both in the plant sample as well as in any oil extracts that are being taken from this thing? And so how would we uh, be able to monitor this? So he created a, a paper on this, which is actually in the process of being published at this point. So hopefully it will come out in the next bit. But basically, he's created a, a single step process that will do all of them through an HPLC methodology. Fairly quick, easy way to calculate what is the concentration of these things and whether or not you're above or below the requirements. And you can see the different toxins that are present here and how well we can actually observe them. He was quite successful. So it was quite beneficial out of this, uh, a good understanding and how the response curves were quite strong. So it seems to be, or it is very repeatable and very um, applied out of this. And we're expecting over time that we're, this will become one of the more industry standards of this that will have to be done at all levels before products can be sold. Here's our pretty little gradients that uh, HPLC gradient that we're able to monitor. And so we can actually see the, the observation of the, the samples as they come out and the methodologies and how well we're actually able to recover most of these samples. There is some shifting that's occurring on this um, depending on what the sample is, but it remains fairly consistent. And so we think it is a positive moving forward. Okay, so Health Canada's ultimate goal and what they're mandated to by the government as part of the, the Cannabis Act was actually to maintain and improve the health of Canadians. And they have to make, um, be able to regulate these products so that they don't cause harm to anyone out of this one. So by actually doing a methodology like this, which is he's been working on, was able to find these samples, um, measure the toxins present in them in about one hour. So it was a fairly quick cycle time for this one. And then they're, ultimately their companies are going to have to have these data reported and um, uh, as part of their uh, logging. I'm not expecting it to be distributed as public knowledge, but there has to be thresholds and they have to be able to track this in case there's any recalls. Uh, one final little talk um, that we've been working on. I was actually worried I was gonna run late. Apparently I'm a fast talker when nobody asks me questions. Uh, was uh, Jerome, another student in my lab has been monitoring the, the quality of the internal environment within some of the growth spaces that we've been working with and the techniques that he's been using, we've been using in other locations. We're actually quite surprised at the variability that occurs within a lot of these spaces, uh, both within a green, we always knew greenhouses would have a fairly large variability, but even within some of these controlled environment spaces, they can be quite high. And so you can actually see the data here is almost three, four degrees um, Celsius differentials that are occurring. Dependent on if you're near the door or if you're farther away from it, where the air handling systems are. But we have to be aware that if we're after a uniform product within a lot of the controlled environment spaces, that we have to have a, a uniform environment. And having these large differentials will actually cause changes on this. And so his is more on the engineering side. So he is monitoring the environment, but building these little data sensor kits and having the ability to monitor these. And we are in the process of actually releasing uh, a public domain methodology on how to do this and how you can actually collect all this information. Um, it should be fairly quick and easy for most people to do it and be able to store the data online so that it could be public access also if anybody wants to know anything about that. So I have to say thank you to everyone that's worked in my lab for this point. Here's a, a, a photo of my last, I guess, lab luncheon that we occurred. We ended up highlighting the work of uh, basically four different researchers, students that have been in, in the lab. Some of them have graduated and some are in the process of graduating. And then all the industry partners that I work with to push these things forward. So the LED lighting technologies, UTEC, Exca is one of the cannabis companies that we work with a fair bit. Rose uh, Life Sciences is another one that we work with, Signify, which was 
affiliated with Phillips and is where we did the intercanopy lighting work with that. And then all the groups groups across Canada, um, Health Canada, NSERC, which is our major funding agency, uh, McGill University, QAQCC, and the MRCC, as well as the other universities that we work with. Thank everyone that's currently in the lab at some level or has contributed to this data. And I think I can take questions now. And I'm at 45 almost exactly, so I'm good. Mark, thank you so much for this uh, very interesting talk and for covering, you know, such a, and presenting the very large type of topics which are done uh, in the lab, in the research group. This is really interesting and really fascinating. We are very much looking for, I'm very much looking forward to hear, you know, further um, results from the lab since it seems like you're working on an enormous array topics starting from you know cultivation to post harvest to processing is going to be fascinated and i think that our audience is highly impressed as well because our first question is uh, is there any mcgill create uh, participation options for international uh, attendees for the for example phd project program um, for someone who is based in germany with an msc in agricultural background specializing in, in agrobioscience so I think that people are, you were impressed people enough that you're going to have a crowd of people trying to join your lab, if it's possible. So it's it's not just me. There's nine researchers across Canada. So there's two researchers in Saskatchewan, two in Ottawa, and then the remaining, whatever that is, five are in at McGill. That being said, we also have collaborators that we work with. So there's a fair number of other people that aren't um, actually directly affiliated with uh, the QAQCC, which we also work with. Uh, the, the rules that we have, and it's partially insert create rules, is that the student that comes has to be affiliated with a, one of those primary nine researchers. We can have secondary researchers, as many as you want, actually, to be perfectly honest, um, at other places. We can do internships almost anywhere in the world uh, as part of the project, but it's still limited that you have to be a, an enrolled student at one of those three locations. So if you're a German student, and want to do it as just an internship to us, we can discuss that, but that's not what the CREATE funding is allowing us to do. So that's a limitation of the governmental funding system. But if most of my, I'd say more than half of the students in the lab and currently as part of the QAQCC are not Canadian. We have a number of Americans. I think we're sitting at about four Americans, uh, some Iranians, some Indians, Bangladesh. We cover most of the world slowly. That's interesting. Um, we have a few questions about the light uh, in HPS, you know, versus the LED and the intercrop inter canopy lighting. The one question is that what type of flower samples for the cannabinoid analysis were taken from the plants? Were they, were they just the epical part of the plants? I mean, the, the cola? This is because from the pictures, it seems that the plant density was uh, high, seems to be high. Um, what whatever was shown in the presentation. So I guess yeah. the person is thinking about standardization. So so we ended up taking a subsample. So we took the sample and then we took a subsample out of that. Um, we did break it down and they were they ended up being ground at some point for analysis out of that. We didn't take the primary large coal at top. That was not what we were after. We were after the smaller samples. Um, so that's a good question. I'd have to defer that to, to Justin specifically. Yeah, interesting. Another question is about the light intensity, um, about the spectra result, the HPS versus amber light versus red, et cetera. The experiment was conducted in the cannabis plant that were exposed to about 400 micromole per meter square per second. And the is it possible that uh, this low light level, I guess the person assumed that this is a low light level, uh, it was where the, the spectra effect on other crops and high intensity wash out any spectral effect. Hmm. Are you repeat? Are you planning to repeat those experiments at higher light levels to find out if this would happen? Well, that's a good question. See, I, I do find that funny that 400 is considered a low light level. Right. Um, for most other crops that's considered crazy high. Um, yeah. In most of ours, we find that 800 is saturation for a lot of it. Uh, 
I would say the, the challenge is finding lights for some of those narrow spectrum lights. Um, they don't exist on the market. I have to get them custom made. So that's one reason why I work with UTEC is because we have to get these lights custom made for that. But even with that, I don't know if I can get over 800 for most of the, some of those more narrow spectrum ones. So if the lights ever show up and we have the ability to do it, sure. At this point, it's not on my initial plan. I, I'm going to say that I'm expecting at some point we're going to find that the cannabis is good at taking high levels of light. And I agree with that. But we're going to find that a lot of it's kind of wasted light as we work our way through it. So we're going to have to start tailoring these things. What is the exact tailor and what is the amount that we want to provide will probably be debated for a long period of time. But I know some people have reported like 2,000 plus micromoles of light, which I think is insanity, to be perfectly honest. Like that's a lot of light. And I don't, yeah. I, it does have a continuing linear increase on it, but it's a fairly shallow linear increase. So I'm still not sold that that's where it needs to be. But so yeah. the short answer to that is that if we get the lights, then sure. But I don't have the lights, So we probably have a few years before that technology reaches that point. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's interesting how cannabis totally shifted our view on light intensities. I mean, for any other crop thinking about 400 or 700 or 1,000, 1,200 would have been totally insane. But uh, we are thinking about it still, still the to come, whether to see whether this is justified or not. we Right now we all live, most of us live under the assumption that it, we are there and we should be there, but it's, we are still all testing it. So it's interesting. Yeah. Another question, some other question are dealing with the light spectrum in uh, this uh, experiment uh, about the interlight, uh, uh, interlight study. Uh, was the spectrum similar to the um, overhead the LED light? So was it, the, it, it was. So, I'm not. One of our challenges is we're not allowed to say what that specific spectrum is, um, and so it is very similar to it. So it's a more balanced light system. And if you saw the saw the pictures, you can kind of guess what that color is based on what that is. But we're, we weren't allowed to report that. That was considered a uh, proprietary. Yeah, and uh, another question related to this is that uh, about the HPS versus the LED study, do you, th do you think or do you have any information that uh, suggests what, uh, whether the result will be similar under various uh, spectrum for the LED? Um, yeah, well, similar to, that's why I presented both of them back to back. So I, I know I've got into a few arguments and discussions with people who keep telling me that they like certain spectrum for certain reasons. I won't say that I'm a huge fan of it. People who like the 680 uh, wavelength, um, nanometer wavelength, I'm not a fan of it. I don't see the benefit of it. I think it's a bit of a waste. There's some green lights that have certain benefits, and so I won't expect the, the same kind of response out of that. I play in slightly off. So I like the 630 to, well, actually about 580 to 630 is kind of my, my preferred spectrum range on that. A lot go into the 660. I don't believe it will get the same response there either. Uh, we find that it, you actually get a decrease as you go into that space and similar effects within the blue. So it, it it is somewhat dependent on what the LEDs and the wavelengths that you choose. So I won't say that it will be completely the same across. Yeah, this is so complicated, you know, working on the interaction between intensity and spectrum and the various, you know, now we also have above light and intercanopy light. It's interesting. Interestingly, the results are going to emerge in all of the studies that so many groups are now starting to do. Agreed. Yeah. Um, another question is about the terpenes. Uh, did blue light also increase uh, total terpenes or specific terpenes? Do you have any information about it? Because uh, in, the, well, in your result, you showed that it increased the THC. So, so we we saw it on the THC. Um, there was so for the one that's the interlighting, we did not see a difference there at all. Um, for the other one, there was some variation, but not as much as you would have expected. It was actually surprising how how, how little it was being impacted by those. Uh, we do find the, under the blue that it is higher. So it was statistical for some of them. Um, that paper is published. I'd have to go back and look at exactly what those numbers are on uh, Valerio's paper, but it did have some impact, but not as much as we were expecting. That's that will be the, the take home from that is that wavelength did not Im impact terpene as much as expected. That's interesting. 
May this type of result will help us in the future to find out exactly where in the biochemical pathways, you know, those light uh, spec intensity of spectra are hitting it. Where is it affecting it? Agreed. It's interesting that the results on terpenes and cannabinoids were different. Okay, another question is that deals with cultivation in the field, so not under controlled conditions. Um, what are alternatives for people cultivating out outdoors do exist to increase light in the field? Are we actually thinking about it? So, and so I've thought about that a fair bit. I actually thought you'd add it in as like the drip line. So you could actually have an intercanopy lighting system that's inside of something that has a drip line, either on the ground or something close. And then I saw a paper, not a paper, a photo of a company that's selling some high value plower. And they actually cover the plants with lights outside. So LEDs are getting cheap enough that you can do outdoor lighting. Um, and so do it basically as a day extension. Uh, I wouldn't do it as a night interruption, at least not for cannabis for, for any good reason, but you could do it as a day extension type system and you can increase your DLI based on that. I haven't seen much done here in North America. I think believe it was in Pakistan is where that one was being done for. So or someplace like that. Um, so it is expecting that it will slowly start creeping itself out. I know within the turf industry, so turf grass, um, there is companies that to maintain sports fields will have lights that will travel back and forth. And those are outdoors to try to push up their DLI to maintain the quality of that. So, so there, it is coming. If it isn't, if you can't find it now, I'm sure that there will be somebody within the next year or two that will be providing these. So it is doable. Um, yes, and you know, I agree, because when we think, for example, about cut, uh, cut flower production, and we think about the uh, photoperiod light, we know that there is some production, you know, outdoors, which uses a uh, light as well. So here we are talking about a mix of photoperiod and, um, uh, photoperiod and intensity, light intensity, it will be interesting to see. And I agree that with the reduction in, in cost and energy in the LED, we're probably heading this way. Okay, and the other question deals with the interaction between the morphology and like plant plant architecture structuring and the pruning strategies and the in uh, intercanopy lights. So the question is, I, are you going to continue investigating intercanopy lights, maybe with different morpho uh, morphologies or pruning strategies? And I, I think this is an interesting question, you know, that we've been dealing with yeah. as well, because I mean, if the intercanopy lighting will work, then definitely it will require changes in plant architecture to, to take advantage of it. Agreed. Um, I would say, so right now there's, it's one of the higher labor is the pruning and the management of that. I'm not, well, this is going to go slightly out there. I like the intercanopy light. I think it works. The problem is, is that being able to prune and manage around that is quite challenging. If we could actually have a light that's slightly below and shining up into it, so a subcanopy, probably would make life easier because it, it you should get the same effect. I can't say definitive, same effect on the plant yield and the, the change that we've seen. But it's now you can prune around and everything would be below. The, I don't see anybody selling those kind of lights yet out there. It is something that I would expect in the future, just because it, it becomes too difficult for us to prune around each place and maintaining. So the, the benefit of Sig, uh, Signify was that they actually had a light that was cold enough that if the light um, plant laid on top of it, it actually didn't dry itself out and die. Um, and the, But there's a lot of companies that are actually selling leds that they get too warm and they actually cause harm to the plant so pruning is one of it but also maintaining that internal environment and being able to maintain the heat from the led so it's not doing any damage is another part so i could see us playing with at least a sub canopy but i'm expecting a lot of that is going to have to get shifted also um you can talk to justin about it he had to he, he complained one time because it was such a horrible way of doing the pruning so he had to learn or do slightly modified it so it became less of a hassle um and just because I can see people getting grumpy about it. So it is there is going to have to be a, a challenge, challenge and a balancing of those different challenges as we work through that. Thank you. 
I loved the questions. You know, if I, if I compare the questions that we receive now, if we were able actually to ask now in comparison to what we were able to ask two or three years ago, there's a huge gap. So it's nice. I like the next question actually is, you know, I'm trying to bridge a flower development to light intensity, which I love. And the question is, have you studied the correlation among flowering harvest time, light types, and cannabinoid analysis? And studies have shown that the complete flowering stage increased cannabinoid content, including of THC concentration. So are we basically, what I get out of this question is, are we expecting interaction between light spectrum and cannabinoid at various developmental stages? I, I will say yes. I have almost no data to support it at this point. Um, I, we have done a few studies. They're still early stage where we actually started running them. Uh, and you you see that there's such a large difference that the plants are beha behaving differently. So they're getting to different stages quicker. And so the, then the question is, well, should we be shifting our, our experiment so that we're more adaptive to what the plant is? And I think the short answer is yes. It's just most of us haven't done enough research to prove that. What I'm expecting is as these new lights come out, then the growers are going to have to shift and become more adaptive to whatever that requirement is and be aware of what the plant requirements are. But I haven't done any of that work, but I'm expecting that will come. So am I. We have so many more questions. I guess we'll entertain one more since we're already, or maybe two more, since we are already running out of time. Um, the question, I guess, ask about the general conditions other than the light intensity. It, did all the soil mixtures were the same at all experiments? Uh, no, e so each experiment had their own own method. Uh, so, and different soil type, I mean, it's different soil mixtures based on those. So we're, we do a lot of work with industry. And so we use the industry standard and then we modify whatever we need to do our test. So we're not trying to say all of our systems use the exact same perlite cocoa mix, not by any stretch. So we're we have to use our industry um, standards, well, industry growing methods, and then we just build off of those. But as part of one experiment, it was all done the same. Yeah. Uh, the last question again. It's so difficult because there's so many questions. A lot of interest in the talk, and we already passed the time. Um, this is about a question about the uh, te uh, techniques for the post-harvest studies. For freeze drying, what sort of humidity sensor do you use that works well under those temperatures? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, we actually played with a couple different versions. We found the really, really cheap ones didn't work as well as they should. Um, you'd have to talk to Philip specifically on what the final choice was. I think he bought about five different ones. Three of them worked. I think it was three that worked reasonably well two of them were kind of wonky so we dumped those two so most of them could pull it off was the short answer but if you want to reach out to philip or email me and i'll pass that question on to him wonderful mark i want to thank you again you know for joining us for this webinar and sharing all this fascinating and really interesting results and research topic that you're exploring in the lab and uh, thanks a lot. And we'll be looking forward, you know, to hearing more wonderful things from you, Lav, in the time to come. So, okay. well, thanks thank you lot. so much for inviting me. And um, I, I'm happy that I was able to present what my lab's doing and what all these wonderful students have been able to pull off for the for the last couple of years out of this. So Wonderful. And uh, also, I want to encourage uh, the audience to sign up for our usual ma mailing list. So even if you haven't done that, so please do it. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you next month in our next webinar. And thank you. Okay. Thank you all.